After Buddha was dead, people showed his shadow for centuries afterwards in a cave. An immense, frightful shadow. God is dead. But as the human race is constituted, there will perhaps be caves for millenniums yet, in which people will show his shadow. And we, we have still to overcome his shadow. The Joyful Science is one of Friedrich Nietzsche's middle works. As a sort of sequel to Daybreak, it features many of the ideas for which Nietzsche would later become famous. But when we look at the chronology, we see that the work was also released before his most well-known works such as Beyond Good and Evil, Das Spoke Zarathustra, The Genealogy of Morals, and Twilight of the Idols and the Antichrist. Although that's not exactly entirely true, because The Joyful Science has an interesting publishing history. The first edition of the work was released in 1882, while a second edition, which added a fifth book and a prelude and appendix with poems, came out in 1876. So in between publishing the first and the second edition, Nietzsche wrote and released his two most famous works, Beyond Good and Evil and Das Spoke Zarathustra. And the additions to the second edition will sound very familiar to anyone who has read The Genealogy of Morals. So in a way, the book we know today as The Joyful Science functions as a sort of transition between the intermediate and the late Nietzsche. Many ideas that will come to dominate his thought in his later work will find their first expression here. The two most notable ideas are the death of God and the eternal recurrence. In this video we will discuss those ideas along with other central themes of the work. By the way, we have covered many of Nietzsche's works right here on the channel. We have a full analysis of Beyond Good and Evil, The Genealogy of Morals, Twilight of the Idols, The Antichrist, Daybreak and Ecce Homo. Check out the links in the description if you're interested. And if you like analyses like these, we highly recommend you subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. Thank you. With that said, let's dive in and start where we always start, with the title. The Joyful Science is a translation of the German Die Frohliche Wissenschaft. There are some problems associated with coming up with a good translation. Fröhlich is German for joyful, lighthearted, lacking in seriousness or solemnity. It's simply one of those words where there is no one-to-one -one translation, and joyful seems to be good enough. That's problem number one. But a more serious problem concerns the word Wissenschaft. This is translated as science, and technically Wissenschaft is the German word for science. But the word has come to mean something slightly different in the 21st century than in the 19th, when Nietzsche used the word. Today we associate the word science with disciplines such as physics, chemistry and biology. But when Nietzsche uses the word, he refers to the general concept of having a system of knowledge, which would include disciplines such as history, philosophy, linguistics and psychology. In short, the disciplines we would today call the humanities. When we speak of the joyful science, we need to keep this in mind at all times, as it's easy to forget about it once we're reading the text. The title as a whole is also a reference to a phrase that was well known in Europe at the time, Gaia Scienza, which refers to the art of poetry of medieval knight poets known as the troubadours. These poets and musicians composed music dealing mainly with themes like chivalric love. They traveled around and played their music at the court of a nobleman who served as their patron and source of income. Oftentimes they were of noble descent themselves, hence why Nietzsche called them warrior poets. In this tradition of troubadours and the Gaia Scienza, their art of poetry and music, Nietzsche saw the birth of romantic European poetry, which treated love as a passion and which has come to dominate European culture ever since. We can understand without further detail why love as a passion, it is our European specialty, must absolutely be of noble origin. As is well known, its invention is due to the Provençal poet cavaliers, those brilliant, ingenious men of the Gai Saber. Gaia Scienza, to whom Europe owes so much, and almost owes itself. Principally, Nietzsche wants to invoke a certain association of light-footedness with his title, a recurring theme throughout all of his later works. Nietzsche constantly speaks of a new dawn, free spirits, light-footedness, dancing, being joyful, laughing. By referring to the whimsical works of the troubadours and their songs about aristocratic courtly love, Nietzsche seeks to invoke an imagery of aristocracy, but without the sense of solemnity we commonly associate with the word. Above all, troubadours did not possess a science of composing music and poetry. Of course, it was an art. This is another reason why the word science to translate Wissenschaft is so problematic in the 21st century, as the implication here is that Nietzsche seeks to create a new joyful kind of art rather than a science in the strict sense 
of the 21st century meaning of the term. Yet, there is also an element of strict, rigorous thinking in the meaning of Wissenschaft, of which Nietzsche demands a lot from his readers. So really, the word Wissenschaft can be thought of as standing somewhere between art and science. This is all very vague and abstract, perhaps, but more will become clear as we dive deeper into the work. Nietzsche put careful thought in the title of his works, and it's always worth the effort to try and understand the title, because in a way, it already gives away half of the book. In Ecce Homo, Nietzsche claims that The Joyful Science is his most personal work. This may be due to the fact that this book contains more poems than any other work of his. For this video, we will not focus on the content or analysis of these poems, and we will generally not produce them unless they are exceptionally useful in explaining the philosophy in the work. But they are worth reading for the serious student of Nietzsche because these poems, although they are of questionable quality, depending on who you ask, they are helpful in understanding the atmosphere of the work. Perhaps more than any other work of Nietzsche, The Joyful Science is about atmosphere, about a certain mood or vibe, a kind of feeling that's hard to put into words. We saw already how difficult the title is, bursting with associations and subtexts, ranging from the difficulty to translate it to the reference to medieval troubadours. The way to really understand this work is not to read the text and leave it at that. More than any other work of Nietzsche's, although this advice applies to all of his works, The Joyful Science paints a picture that is only slowly and incrementally comprehended. The general advice is to read it, read it again, read some other works by Nietzsche, and come back to it. Over time, the picture will become clearer. Nietzsche wrote for a small audience. He asks a lot of his readers with regards to background knowledge in philosophy, art, and culture, and he counts on you to connect the various dots yourself. We've done a video on what to do if you feel stuck reading Nietzsche, which might come in handy as we dive deep into the work and try to entangle the many threads that Nietzsche embarks on in this chaotic, atmospheric work. So, now that we have our little introduction and analysis of the title out of the way, let's jump into the work itself and see what all the fuss is about. The Joyful Science marks a significant departure from Nietzsche's earlier works not just in tone and atmosphere, but also by the introduction of two concepts which would become increasingly important in his later work. The first of these two concepts is the infamous death of God. After Buddha was dead, people showed his shadow for centuries afterwards in a cave, an immense, frightful shadow. God is dead, but as the human race is constituted, there will perhaps be caves for millenniums yet, in which people will show his shadow. And we, we have still to overcome his shadow. This is the first mention of the famous phrase in Nietzsche's works in general, and in the joyful science in particular. But let's take a look at the most famous passage in which the phrase appears again. Nietzsche paints the scene of a bright morning on a town square. A madman lights a lantern and tells the crowd that he's looking for God. I seek God, I seek God. As there were many people standing about who did not believe in God, he caused a great deal of amusement. Why, is he lost? said one. Has he strayed away like a child? said another. Or does he keep himself hidden? Is he so afraid of us? Has he taken a sea voyage? Has he emigrated? The people cried out laughingly. The madman is mocked by the crowd. But ultimately, he tells them that God is not gone, but that God is dead, and we have killed him. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we console ourselves, the most murderous of all murderers? The holiest and the mightiest that the world has hitherto possessed has bled to death under our knife. Who will wipe the blood from us? This is an important event. Nietzsche, true the character of the madman, calls it the greatest event in history. There never was a greater event. And on account of it, all who are born after us belong to a higher history than any history hitherto. But this event, the death of God, has not yet reached the people. The madman laments that he is too early. The people aren't ready for his message. I come too early, he then said. I am not yet at the right time. This prodigious event is still on its way, and is traveling. It has not yet reached men's ears. Lightning and thunder need time. The light of the stars needs time. Deeds need time, even after they are done, to be seen and heard. Now, the first question to ask ourselves is, what does all of this mean? The death of God is one of those Nietzschean concepts that have been misinterpreted countless times. Even the genre of the message itself is something people tend to get wrong. It's not a celebration or an admirable achievement. In the context of the full passage, it's glaringly obvious it's presented as a disaster, as a historical event of great significance. But in the decades since Nietzsche wrote these words, the entire passage has been omitted as people relentlessly quoted the three words God is dead 
and transfixed their own meaning to these words, divorced from the context from which they appear. The death of God is not a cause for celebration, although it does bring with it a new fruitful possibility, but we'll get to that later. The death of God is not even about God per se, but rather everything God stands for. The death of God really is the death of meaning. Through the advances of science and philosophy, religious faith, more specifically the Christian faith, has become superfluous. Nietzsche was privy to the trend that faith in Europe was vanishing at a rapid pace. You might think that people in the 19th century were much more religious than today, and you're right. But Nietzsche saw the writing on the wall nonetheless, and predicted this huge catastrophe, this great event in history as he calls it, the death of God. But as the parable of the madman shows, Nietzsche also realized he was speaking before his time, that people weren't yet ready to really take this message to heart. The disappearance of faith is not necessarily catastrophic. How could it be? This is the same person who wrote a book called The Antichrist, in which he systematically seeks to destroy Christian morality. In other words, it's safe to say that Nietzsche wasn't really a fan of Christianity. So why is he complaining about the death of God? Because it leaves behind a void of meaninglessness. And as he wrote in the genealogy of morals, any meaning is better than no meaning. The looming prospect of nihilism was for Nietzsche a much worse alternative than the traditional Christian morality. Because in the Christian worldview, at least the world is imbued with meaning. A meaning which is heavily rejected by Nietzsche, to be sure, but a meaning nonetheless. What is at stake with the death of God is the lack of meaning as such. Without a reassuring metaphysical framework to center our lives around, everything crumbles. That was Nietzsche's greatest fear. As we discussed in our video on Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, the rise of Christianity represented a successful slave revolt in morals. The victory of the slave over the master. But at least there was a revolt, a fight, a conflict, a battle. With the looming prospect of nihilism, Nietzsche envisions a future in which not even the slaves have the will or vitality to fight. What would such an utterly defeated nihilism look like? Nietzsche doesn't really tell us, as he spends much more time trying to come up with alternatives to nihilism, with ways of trying to get us out of this mess which the death of God has left us in. But in another work of his, Da Spoke Zarathustra, he tells of the last man, the man afflicted with nihilism, the man who has lost all vitality. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man, and blinks. One no longer becomes poor or rich. Both are too burdensome. Who still wants to rule? Who still wants to obey? Both are too burdensome. No shepherd and one herd. Everyone wanted the same. Everyone is equal. He who has other sentiments goes voluntarily into the madhouse. They have their little pleasures for the day and their little pleasures for the night. This is the state of existence which Nietzsche envisions for mankind after nihilism has firmly taken root. But as of yet, at least when Nietzsche was writing these words, we are not there yet. An important aspect of the parable is that the people are laughing at the madman. They don't realize what's upon them. The same sentiment returns in Zarathustra. When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he looked again at the people and was silent. There they stand, said he to his heart. There they laugh. They understand me not. I am not the mouth for these ears. But what about today? It's been over a hundred years since Nietzsche wrote these words. More than a century has passed. Has the death of God as an idea, an experience, taken root yet? Do we realize it? And have we descended deeper into nihilism as Nietzsche predicted? I'll leave it up to the viewer to decide. Returning to the joyful science, we see remarkably little of this pessimism where the death of God is concerned. At this point in Nietzsche's intellectual development, even though the death of God as the loss of reassuring metaphysics and meaning is a catastrophe waiting to unfold itself and wash over Europe, there is a peculiar optimism throughout the work. As Nietzsche sees in this destruction of traditional morality an opportunity for mankind to create a new set of values, a new morality, away from the traditional Christian framework. In fact, in the parable of the madman, he speaks of mankind becoming gods themselves. With what water could we cleanse ourselves? What lustrums, what sacred games shall we have to devise? Is not the magnitude of this deed too great for us? Shall we not ourselves have to become gods merely to seem worthy of it? With the death of God, there arises the need to create something new to take his place. What would that new morality look like? Well, for one thing, it would look very different from the old morality. And not just on a surface level either. The death of God is a thorough event, and it's not the death of Christian morality as such, but the death of 
all moralities that have their roots in the conditions that led to Christianity. What does this mean? It means that the slave morality as such has to go. Not just Christianity itself, but other moralities too that hinge upon the same set of ideas and assumptions that made Christianity possible. In particular, Nietzsche is aiming at a belief in total equality, the chief characteristic of slave morality. In this capacity, he is extremely scornful of the English moralists, the utilitarians, who don't believe in God, but who seek to justify his morality anyway. In Beyond Good and Evil, the following passage about English utilitarians, exemplified by philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, is indicative of Nietzsche's scorn. Not one of those ponderous, conscience-stricken herding animals wants to have any knowledge or inkling of the fact that the general welfare is no ideal, no notion that can be at all grasped, but is only a nostrum, that what is fair to one may not at all be fair to another, that the requirement of one morality for all is really a detriment to higher men. In short, that there is a distinction of rank between man and man, and consequently between morality and morality. They are an unassuming and fundamentally mediocre species of men, these utilitarian Englishmen, and, as already remarked, insofar as they are tedious, one cannot think highly enough of their utility. Nietzsche's critiques of these moralities is that they all, in a roundabout way, seek to arrive at the same conclusions as Christianity, but without having to invoke God. What he means by this is that all these moralists, from John Stuart Mill to Kant, have a predetermined conclusion they want to reach mainly an ethics based on the general equality of mankind, an idea which is foundational to slave morality, a morality of the herd. These moralists have done away with God, but it has made them only more convinced of his rules. They are rid of the Christian God and therefore think it all the more incumbent upon them to hold tight to Christian morality. This is an English way of reasoning. In the same paragraph, Nietzsche goes on to write, Christianity is a system, a complete outlook upon the world, conceived as a whole. If its leading concept, the belief in God, is wrenched from it, the whole is destroyed. Nothing vital remains in our grasp. It is true only on condition that God is truth. It stands or falls with the belief in God. If the English really believe that they know intuitively and of their own accord what is good and evil, if, therefore, they assert that they no longer need Christianity as a guarantee of morality, this in itself is simply the outcome of the dominion of Christian values and a proof of the strength and profundity of this dominion. This dominion will soon end, once people realize that the slave morality that gave birth to Christian values now gives birth to English utilitarianism or Kantianism. It will all lead to nihilism. These moralities are dead ends. If all these moralities are dead in the water, then what else remains? Nietzsche is hesitant to say in this work. Only in the following book, Thus spoke Zarathustra, will Nietzsche speak of the Übermensch, the creator of new values. As far as the joyful science is concerned, the Übermensch does not exist yet. But there is a hint in the passage about the madman, when he rhetorically asks the townspeople if mankind should not become gods themselves to atone for their sin of killing God. In other words, should we not become our own value creators, instead of relying upon a transcendent concept like God? Should we not take matters into our own hands? and take this divine role up for ourselves. Remember that in this work, many of Nietzsche's ideas appear for the first time, but not in a fully fleshed out form. The death of God will later be revisited in other works as well. Another such idea, which first appears here in The Joyful Science, but will be expounded upon later, is the famous eternal recurrence. This is another one of Nietzsche's most famous concepts. It appears in The Joyful Science as a thought experiment. One day a demon visits you and tells you you will have to repeat the life you live, including the highs and the lows, including the excitement and including the boredom, an infinite number of times. The life you live now, the life you will live in the future, will be eternally repeated, like a spinning wheel that turns forever. Nietzsche's question is, how would you react to this scenario? Would you curse the demon or would you be happy to hear this news? We'll quote the paragraph in its entirety because it's just so important and well written. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life 
will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Even the spider in this moonlight between the trees, and even this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence, is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, You are a god and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are or perhaps crush you. The question in each and everything, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal? The thought experiment of the eternal recurrence and the question which Nietzsche asks the reader at the end is really a test about the valuation of life. What is the value of life? This is one of the most fundamental questions humans have been asking themselves. But, perhaps surprisingly, most philosophers answer this question in the negative. That is to say, they hold that life has no intrinsic value. Not the life in the here and now, at least. Let's take a look at a section in Twilight of the Idols, wherein Nietzsche tackles this so-called consensus sapientium, or agreement of the wise. In all ages, the wisest have always agreed in their judgment of life. It is no good. At all times and places, the same words have been on their lips, words full of doubt, full of melancholy, full of weariness of life, full of hostility to life. What does that prove? What does it point to? It points to a philosophical pessimism which Nietzsche sees as endemic in Western culture, beginning with Socrates, who at his trial in Athens made the remark that life is a disease and death is the cure. And Nietzsche sees the same pessimism at work in Christianity, which, in his estimation, is all about saying no to the world in the here and now and shifts its focus away from this material present into some other beyond world, heaven or the kingdom of God. And, of course, the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer is the most pronounced formulation of this pessimism. Thus Nietzsche sees a current of pessimism all throughout Western philosophy, beginning with Socrates, all the way to Christianity, up until the highly influential philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. This is what he means with the consensus sapientium, the agreement of the wise. They all agree that life is no good. Nietzsche then asks these wise a simple question. What does that prove? Does it prove that the wise are right? That consensus sapientium, as I perceived ever more and more clearly, did not in the least prove that they were right in the matter on which they agreed. It proved rather that these sages themselves must have been alike in some physiological particular in order to assume the same negative attitude towards life, in order to be bound to assume that attitude. Rather than proving they are right, the agreement among philosophers of the past merely proves that they're all sick with the same disease, decadence. But diving deeper into this topic now would distract us from the concept at hand, the eternal recurrence. We have explored this topic of decadence in Nietzsche's defiance of the philosophical tradition in much more detail in a video called How Nietzsche Took On the World. If this subject interests you, you can check out that video. Link in the description. The point is that Nietzsche came up with a thought experiment of the eternal recurrence in the context of this philosophical backdrop of pessimism. Let's imagine for a moment that this demon visited Schopenhauer and told him that he has to live this life again and again for all eternity in the exact same way. Surely a notorious pessimist like Schopenhauer, who maintains that it would be better for nothing to exist at all, who said that this world is the worst of all possible worlds, who said that life is a business that does not cover the costs, would curse this demon and tread the prospect of going through life again. For Nietzsche, this pessimism is not a result of careful philosophical analysis. It's rather a symptom of a disease, a disease he dubbed décadence. All judgments on the value of life, says Nietzsche, are symptoms. After all, judgments and valuations of life, whether for or against, cannot be true. Their only value lies in the fact that they are symptoms. They can be considered only as symptoms. Per se, such judgments are nonsense. And what does it say about someone who assigns a negative value to life? For a philosopher to see a problem in the value of life is almost an objection against him, a note of interrogation set against his wisdom, a lack of wisdom. What? Is it possible that all these great sages were not only decadents, but they were not even wise? So what is Nietzsche trying to accomplish with this experiment? The goal would be to pass this demon's test. 
Nietzsche breaks with the philosophical tradition of pessimism and argues for an affirmative mode of existence, an existence in which we say yes to life instead of no. And the ultimate test of this mode of existence is found in your answer to the demon who comes to you on your darkest night and asks you, do you want this moment to return forever and ever? The question of eternal recurrence is presented as a thought experiment in the joyful science, but there are indications that later in Nietzsche's intellectual career, he came to seriously think of it as a possible physical reality. This is most evident in his Nachlass, the collection of notes which were never published during his lifetime, but compiled later on by his sister. However, there is significant debate as to whether or not we should take these writings seriously, and if so, to what degree. If you are interested in these later developments, we have done a video on the returnal recurrence as the concept appears in these notes. Check it out if you're interested. As far as the joyful science is concerned, the eternal recurrence, as it appears in this work, is not as fleshed out as it would later become. Although all the elements are present in the thought experiment as it's formulated in the section we quoted, they will be fleshed out in greater detail in other works. We'll take a look at two such elements. Firstly, one thing to keep in mind about the eternal recurrence is that it's mainly a test of how well you are capable of handling suffering. Although handling is the wrong word even, because Nietzsche wants you to actively embrace suffering. It's easy to say yes to life and to the proposition of the demon when everything is going well. Everyone is an optimist when things are going well. But that is not really the point of the thought experiment. The true challenge of the eternal recurrence is about saying yes to life even when things are horrible or seem hopeless. Can you say yes to life even though you've just lost a loved one? Can you say yes to life even as the doctor tells you you are terminally ill? Can you say yes to life even when you see no way out? This is the true test of an affirmative philosophy, a true saying of yes. You might say this is an unattainable ideal presented by Nietzsche. But nevertheless, the thought experiment is provocative precisely because it seems so unattainable. It's an ideal to strive towards, not a reality to be experienced. Is such a radical saying of yes to life, even at the lowest points in a human lifetime, even possible? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Let's take a look at another element which is present in rudimentary form in the passage of the joyful science, but which is not yet completely fleshed out. This second element is about the opposite of suffering. It's about joy. Earlier we mentioned how easy it is to want the return of the same when things are going well. Of course, you want to repeat a fun, fulfilling experience again and again. Who wouldn't? But Nietzsche wants us to dig a little deeper and really think about what it would entail to want a present moment to repeat itself again and again and again. In order to say yes to life utterly and completely in a moment of joy, one must also say yes to everything that has led up until that point and yes to everything that will come after. There is no saying yes to a single moment in time. To desire one moment means to desire every moment, to desire life itself, including all the bad parts, including all the suffering one endures. It's all the same, to want life when things are bad and to want life when things are good. It's all the same, because in this radical formulation, there is no single moment without everything that led up to that moment or everything that will proceed from this moment. In the Nachlass, his unpublished notebooks, Nietzsche writes about this affirmation. We must not only consider those aspects of life which have been denied hitherto as necessary but as desirable, and not only desirable to those aspects which have been affirmed hitherto as complements or first prerequisites, so to speak, but for their own sake as the more powerful, more terrible and more veritable aspects of life in which the latter's will expresses itself most clearly. In other words, if you are tempted in a moment of exuberant joy and euphoria, to affirm this moment, then in order to really do so, it must also entail the affirmation of everything that has led up to that point. Can you say yes to life knowing all of this? How everything is connected? Did you ever say yes to one joy? Oh, my friends, then you said yes to all woe as well. All things are chained and entwined together. All things are in love. If ever you wanted one moment twice, if ever you said... You please me, happiness, instant, moment. Then you wanted everything to return. You wanted everything in you, everything eternal, everything chained, entwined together, everything in love. Oh, that is how you loved the world, you everlasting man. Loved it eternally and for all time. And you say even to woe, go, but return. For all joy wants 
eternity. The eternal recurrence has been misrepresented or misunderstood by quite a lot of people. At its core, it's an enormous ask, something that might be impossible for any human alive to actually fulfill. Nietzsche himself certainly struggled with the enormity of this idea. That's why in The Joyful Science, the paragraph detailing the eternal recurrence is titled The Heaviest Burden, because it is quite a heavy burden to bear. In fact, Nietzsche himself wasn't completely sure if humans were up to the task of actually doing this. Zarathustra himself, in Das Spoke Zarathustra, eventually gets round to the idea and actively wills the eternal return of the same, but only after first being taken aback and shocked by the idea. And Zarathustra, of course, is just a fictional character, but it symbolizes how Nietzsche realized how difficult this mode of existence is. And you could say that the Übermensch, this creature beyond good and evil, who would eternally will this experiment to be true, is not a being that exists today or will ever exist. In Das Spoke Zarathustra, the Übermensch is presented as an ideal, as the next stage in evolution of man. In other words, something not quite human, but also very human at the same time. Something between man and God. Or, to say it bluntly, something that does not exist yet. The concept of the Übermensch is too complex and complicated to tackle in this video, especially since the concept as such does not yet appear in the Joyful Science. But a dedicated deep dive video to this concept is surely coming, so consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the bell button if you don't want to miss it. So far, we've seen how famous Nietzschean concepts found their first seeds in the pages of the Joyful Science. These concepts would later be expanded upon in other works, such as Das Spoke Zarathustra, Beyond Good and Evil, Twilight of the Idols, and The Antichrist. But there is one concept we haven't touched upon yet. That's because, in contrast to the eternal recurrence and the death of God, this idea is even more in its beginning stage than those other two. We're talking about the will to power even though the term is not even used in this book. Even though Nietzsche first discusses the pleasure of feeling power in Daybreak, in The Joyful Science he devotes an entire section to a theory of the sense of power. The very first sentence is already indicative of what the so-called will to power will come to be. We exercise our power over others by doing them good or by doing them ill. That is all we care for. However, in this passage, Nietzsche seems to regard the pleasure of exercising power as a purely psychological drive in humans. As elsewhere in the Joyful Science, he notes that only intelligent beings have the capacity for feeling powerful. In other words, we are still a far cry away from the conception of the will to power as it would come to dominate his later works. A will to power in the sense of the creation of values, a principle of growth and self-overcoming, and the basis for a new post-death-of-God mode of being. And if Nietzsche indeed came to regard the will to power as a metaphysical principle, as opposed to merely a psychological drive later in life, then in the joyful science this prototypical version of the will to power is only concerned with psychology, and not a kind of metaphysics. But it's interesting to see how this idea came to grow and occupy an increasingly important place in Nietzsche's overall philosophy. We've done a dedicated video on the will to power, which you can check out by clicking the link in the description. With this, we've now discussed three important Nietzschean ideas that found their beginnings in the joyful science. The death of God, the eternal recurrence, and the will to power. Of course, the book is much more than these three ideas. The entire text deals with a wide-ranging set of ideas we haven't touched upon. For example, Nietzsche's takes on science and the skepticism that is prevalent in this work. And since Nietzsche called this work his most personal book, we should also make note of the many poems that are present here. In other words, we highly recommend you read the actual book after watching this video. It goes without saying that watching a video like this is not a substitute for reading the actual work. Sure, they can serve as good introductions, but nothing replaces the experience of engaging with the text yourself and making your own connections. The Joyful Science is one of those works like many of Nietzsche's books, that don't set out one big argument in a systemic, orderly matter. Rather, the book deals in aphorisms about a broad range of subjects. This might make the reading of this work disorienting for some. We have addressed this difficulty of reading Nietzsche in a video dedicated to those readers who get stuck reading Nietzsche. We'll leave a link in the description. But the short answer is that if you feel stuck or lost reading Nietzsche, you should just keep going. Nietzsche's philosophy is like a tapestry, and reading his books is like closely examining the separate threads that make up this tapestry. You might feel lost at first, but as you keep reading and exploring different threads, over time you'll get an idea of the big picture. 
you have to trust the process and keep reading and connecting dots. Understanding Nietzsche, or any profound philosopher really, is an exponential process, meaning that it goes slowly at first, but it picks up speed after some time and the rate of your understanding suddenly explodes once you make the click and things fit together. In other words, when you can zoom out and see the entirety of the picture on the tapestry. The Joyful Science is a particularly rewarding read because the poetry in it, should you not skip it like some people do, can provide clues as to the feeling and energy Nietzsche tries to communicate with his philosophy. Like we mentioned at the start of this video, the title of The Joyful Science evokes the medieval European troubadours, traveling warrior poets who sang songs and composed poetry about light subjects such as courtly love, for example. Nietzsche intended the joyful science, and really his philosophy in general, to be equally light-footed. Try going into the work with that mindset, and enjoy the energy and atmosphere, instead of trying to dissect every little sentence or term. If something is not clear to you upon first reading, just keep going. Chances are, you'll come across another aphorism later that will elucidate the meaning of the first one. That means you're beginning to understand, and the tapestry is revealing itself to you. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. It took a long while to make. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe so you can be notified when we release another one. We intend to cover every single work of Nietzsche right here on the channel, and we're well on our way. Comments for the algorithm are, as always, greatly appreciated. And if you'd like to see a dedicated video on the Ubermensch, please let us know as well. We're always looking for subjects that interest our audience, so please don't be shy with your suggestions. This huge video wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreons. If you want to support the work we do on the channel, you can support us over there, and in the higher tiers even have access to Patreon-exclusive videos that are released every month. Thank you to our Patrons for their continued support. It means a lot, and it allows us to create more high-quality work. If you want more Nietzsche, we have done an hour-long deep dive on the genealogy of morals, as well as an analysis of beyond good and evil. Again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.